I almost bought two Submariners before I got the one that I actually have today. If you wanted to buy a Rolex Submariner, you're going to spend nine to $10,000 at an AD. Meanwhile, I've already been charged $11,500 on my credit card. And just like that, we are back again with the Mind the Growth podcast. As always, I am Chris Kinghorn. And I'm Eric Hoffman. Eric, we are going to be talking about watches. You forgot the most important part. This is story time, round two. This is story time. <laughs> this is story time. Cue, cue well, the rainbow. Yeah, exactly. Cue the rainbow. Story time, number one, was was kind of a success. So we're, we're hoping that our subscribers come back and enjoy story time two just as much, if not more, than story time one. So you have to let us know how we do. Yeah, we're we're actually talking watches today, and uh, we both happen to have Rolex Submariners that we both spent a lot of time thinking about and uh, wondering when we were actually going to get one, and we both wound up getting one over the past couple of years. So today is going to be all about how each of us went about getting our delicious and most desired <laughs> Rolex Submariners. You got yours on today? I don't. Oh I knew that we God. were doing this episode, and I <laughs> and I wore my Apple Watch, which is terrible. Uh, what about I, you? I'm I, got, serving... I got mine on. You can't really. Yeah, okay. See. Okay. So, there we go. There it is. Well, I mean, it, does it does it does it look the same? Close. What a, what an embarrassment! But we'll we'll still talk about it. Mine so, reads text messages to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as a a proud sub owner that doesn't even wear his. Tell us, tell us a little story about how yours came to be. All right. So I'm going to approach this in two ways. I am going to tell you guys how I worked with an AD to get a my first Rolex. Uh, an AD is an authorized dealer. And then I'm also going to give you some tips, suggestions, hints of what to do, maybe what not to do. So I guess real quickly, I had an opportunity to get two of them. And uh, we were coming up on a milestone for uh, Data Street, my technology company. And I thought, what better way than to reward myself for all the hard work than to get a Rolex. So I'd gone down to uh, the local authorized Rolex store and I had put my name on the list and checked in frequently. It, it was probably should have been once a month, but I think I was hounding the sales rep probably once a week, popping in to figure out when I could get it. And he finally calls me one day and he says, hey, Chris, we've got your watch. And the funding that we were looking to secure had fallen through. So I'm at this point of, do I buy this watch for this milestone that I have not achieved or do I wait? And it took everything in me not to buy it. And I told the, the sales rep, I said, hey, listen, this is, it's not the right time. You know, if another one comes around, let me know. And that process was, this was a handful of years ago. So if you try to get a Submariner from an AD nowadays, it's a year process. So maybe <laughs> six months. They'll, so, they'll laugh you out the door. <laughs> exactly so me turning down this watch uh, kind of it was a little bit of a, a kick in the nuts to him and and it kind of i don't want to say it, it hurt the reputation that i had or damaged that relationship but obviously not because we fast forwarded uh, call it six or eight months later i went back and i said hey you know there was a mishap before i'm now in a spot i'd love to do this you know let me know when the opportunity is there Second round, it did take a little bit longer. It took about six months or so. And same thing, same exercise. I was there once once a month knocking on the door, kind of chit-chatting, and was able to purchase a Rolex uh, from them. And some of you might be asking, okay, you know, that's great. Uh, if you're not as familiar with where, where the watch market is, it's it's been absolutely crazy. And within the last few weeks, it's actually started to teeter down a little bit on some of the watches that were ridiculously priced. I mean, you, we had watches that were... $30,000 in store if you could buy it through an AD that we're trading for over $100,000. So that spread on on that is, is massive. So some of those larger ticket watches, it kind of started to teeter down. But if you wanted to buy a Rolex Submariner, you're going to spend nine to $10,000 at an AD. If you wanted to buy the exact same watch on what's called the gray market, you're going to spend anywhere between fourteen dollars to $17,000 for the same watch. So if you want that instant gratification, it obviously makes sense to go ahead and if you can pay for it to, to go through through the gray market and find yourself a brand new watch with box and papers. But I ultimately think for long term and longevity and building the relationships with the ADs, if you have the time and you don't need that watch right away, 
then build a relationship with your AD and do whatever you can to go ahead and get that that watch through the AD. And before I hop into my recommendations, any uh, any feedback on my on my sob story there, Eric? <laughs> yeah, you missed a big a big payday on that first round. But hindsight's always twenty twenty, so I don't fault you for that because I had a similar story that I can get into on on my portion of story time. But yeah, I mean, for for those who are not familiar with the watch game today and some of these high end pieces that are out there, to give an example, I, I think today a Submariner retails around nine thousand dollars U.S. and on the quote unquote gray market, you cannot get one for less than fifteen thousand at minimum, and usually that's a used one. So new ones are going closer to $20,000. So that's essentially 100% markup on the actual watch itself just to actually get one. So that's that's why it's so crazy. And these, you know, hard to come by watches are just going through the roof, especially more of the high, high end ones like the Patek Philippe's out there and some of the APs that are also hard to come by. So yeah, it, it's just a crazy game right now. And the background of it, I think, is relatively important. Brands like Rolex, AP, Patek, et cetera, they, they do this purposefully. They do not give out clear numbers of how many they actually produce. They go through this Rolex authorized Rolex is about dealer. a million. Yeah, that's, that's the best guess. They don't publicly publish that, but it, that is probably accurate. But they go through this network of authorized dealers, and they've done that forever, so they can control the actual supply that's out there. So if you actually go into an authorized dealer today, most of them, and I've gone into a few more recently, most of them aren't actually going to have any watches in the cases, and they're going to say they don't have any. But I would say most of them do actually have some for their clients in the basement or back room or wherever they store them. They just won't show them to you because they're for their high-priced customers and people who spend a lot of money with them. So what Chris was saying before is you can become a high roller, so to speak. It's the casino method (laughs) that if you're a high roller, you get treated well. And if you buy a lot from them, then you find your way on the list eventually. But for most people, that's that's a a big chunk of cash to just get in the game. So I will give you my tips and hints of how to be able to enter the dungeon guarded by the dragon in order to get your beloved Rolex. So the first tip I would say is find a local shop or ideally the shop that's closest to you. So it's going to allow you to go into the store once a month, maybe every few weeks. You don't want to be a pest, but you want to build a relationship with them. It also shows them that you're local and you are going to be back. So ultimately, they want to create a relationship with you that they know has longevity. Dress decently. The way you dress is essentially a reflection of the brand. They obviously think extremely highly of the brand. I think the first time that I went in, I had joggers and a hat on, so that probably wasn't the best look. You have to understand that you might not get the the watch that you want immediately. So the idea of creating this spending history with them is as difficult as a Submariner is to get. It's a lot easier to get a Submariner than it is an anniversary day date or a Daytona or a Pepsi. So you have to you have to build up that purchase history and, and don't think that you're gonna just walk into an 80 and get a, a Daytona. It's that's just it's not feasible. Keep in mind that a lot of ADs are also jewelry stores as well too. So you don't necessarily have to buy Rolex as through them in order to, you know, create that purchasing history, whether it's an engagement ring or maybe a nice present for a significant other, very expensive ways to, to build the repertoire. But um, ultimately, it's it's a way to, to, to build that uh, to build that spending and purchase history with the AD. I would get personal, you know, tell them about why you want to buy the watch. Maybe it's a life milestone or a business milestone. Make them truly understand why is this person, I hate to say deserving, but why are you deserving for it? And if you've got a good story behind, you know, why you why you want this watch, why it's so important to you, they're going to understand that a lot better than, hey, this guy just wants to buy this because if he buys it for eight, it's going to be worth 16 when he walks out of here. This is why I didn't take your first piece of advice that you commented about me not buying the first one. Don't flip it. Don't flip it. (laughs) Don't flip it. Don't flip it. Don't flip it. Some dealers say you will get blacklisted. Others say you won't. In my personal opinion, 
as soon as you flip a watch from an AD, it's just a bad look. You're probably going to get screwed. So if you're ever in a situation, unfortunately, where you need to part ways with the watch, this is what I would do. I would go back to the AD and I would say, hey, so-and-so, I can't, I, I need to sell this watch. I've got a $16,000 watch here and I've got a big tax bill that's coming up or you know, we've got to make the mortgage payment, whatever the story might be. Yeah, you could go on the gray market and you could sell it. Or if you take a few thousand dollars less, they'll probably connect you with somebody who you would be able to then sell the watch to. And a lot of people don't talk about this, but if you have transparency with that AD and they know you're not trying to just get out of the watch to, to make more money on it, then you will maintain that relationship with them. And I think that's a very important piece that some people kind of forego, don't oh, really? necessarily yeah. take into consideration. Exactly. And the last piece, this is something that I did not do, but I would try to work with the owner of the shop if at all possible. So I have a really good relationship with a sales rep at an authorized dealer. The guy's amazing. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with him in the, in the past. We have the opportunity to work with him in the future. Very genuine, good person. We've got a great relationship. However, Let's say he unfortunately gets fired or if there's a, a tragic accident or he decides to move to a different shop. Well, I still have the buying history with that shop, but I'm not the client of one of the other sales reps. So my priority versus their, some of their clients is probably going to be a little bit lower. So you spend years and you spend a lot of money to build up these relationships and I would focus on trying to build a relationship with the owner if at all possible. So those are those are my tidbits of suggestions and good luck on uh, getting your Daytona out there. Good luck indeed. And, and I will say there's, there's different schools of thought about the AD route and getting the actual piece you want. Because if, if you really think about it, unless you're intent to start buying and spending a lot of money at a jewelry store, then you're going to actually save money paying the gray market cost of the piece you actually want if that's all you actually want versus you know creating this buying history so it really depends on your goals cuz if your goal is to start a collection well, I will and, say you know, yeah go ahead I will say that I have never purchased anything outside of a watch from the store and I have the opportunity to buy another one coming up here soon that is the the starbucks so the green green bezel submariner so it takes time i will give you that instead of yeah instead of that instant gratification there is the idea of just spending a ton of money at the ad to in order to get the watches that you want and ultimately you're spending the exact same amount that you would have on the gray market but if you have patience and if you can build the relationship and you show show them that you are a good client then there is an opportunity there exactly and and patience is key luck is also a factor and uh, I'll go into a couple of uh, stories similar to you to start off with. I I almost bought two Submariners before I got the one that I actually have today. So the first story is I did exactly what you were talking about. I went into a jewelry store called Hyde Park, which is local to Arizona. Originally, it was at the Biltmore, and I think they're in the in Fashion Square now. They moved. But um, at the time, I was shopping for both an engagement ring and a watch, and that was the proposition that I, I sold myself to to some of these ads because you know their their eyes light up when you want to buy multiple things. So I I started talking with one of the sales associates at Hyde Park, and she was great. She was super nice. She explained the process. This must have been in 2019, I want to say. And maybe even 2018, or around there, a few years ago. And I basically told her, hey, I'm looking for a Submariner. I, I don't even think I mentioned Daytona at the time because I just <laughs> didn't have the cash for a Daytona or the expectation that I'd ever get one. But I told her I wanted a sub at the time. And maybe seven months go by after I first started talking to her. And out of the blue, she sends me a text with a photo of a no date. Submariner. And she said, Hey, just got this in. It's yours if you want it. And I, I waited 24 hours to respond because I really wanted a Submariner with a date on it versus the Submariner with no date. And I responded to her 24 hours later, like basically saying something to the effect of, Hey, I really wanted one with a date. 
I, I'd be happy to come in and see it maybe later this week and see if I, I actually like it. And her response was, oh, I sold it, you know, eight hours ago. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, God damn it. So that was my first miss. And I, I, I shot myself in the foot there. My second miss was I, uh, I think early 2020 eBay started putting out a lot of marketing material that they were getting heavily involved in selling watches to the point where they, they were saying, you know, they guarantee every purchase. They now have a service to authenticate every piece that comes through their system, et cetera. So I started looking on eBay to see what was out there. And I saw this guy selling a, a brand new Submariner with a date. And I think he listed it at the time for like 11,500, which at the time it was still over retail. Cause I think then in 2020, the retail was still around 8,300 or 8,400, if I recall correctly. And so I was like, that's, that's not a bad markup. I think I'm going to try and purchase it. So I hit buy now. I purchased it. The guy seemed to have a, a good reputation on eBay, a good rating, et cetera. And I, everything went through. I got my credit card charged for the 11.5 or whatever it was. And then, you know, a month goes by. And I, I follow up with eBay and the seller. I'm like, hey, what's going on? They're like, we're still authenticating. It's still with the authenticator. I'm like, okay. And so I wait a little longer. Another month goes by. I'm like, it's either authenticated or it's not. So what's the deal? And then I, I wound up calling eBay and they're like, well, we actually reached out to the seller and they never actually sent it to the authenticator. So we're, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Another few weeks go by. They're like, the seller has completely ghosted us. So, you know, we're deactivating their account and we'll have to to submit a request to refund your money. Meanwhile, I've already been charged eleven thousand five hundred dollars on my credit card. And eBay's telling me I, I'm basically giving them an interest free loan for three, four, five months. So another month later, I finally got a refund for what I paid. And I, I was just so pissed off <laughs> that I, I never looked at eBay again for watches because it's just garbage. Go ahead. I think that brings us to a perfect opportunity for this episode is not sponsored by eBay. We don't buy watches <laughs> from you. Through yeah, you. Get your shit together, eBay. So from there, this led me to just kind of browsing all of the gray markets and auction sites that, you know, relatively often have auctions of watches, artwork, etc. It led me to this company that I was not familiar with before, but it was called Antiquorum. Are you familiar with this group? Is that the is that the brand uh that had done that had redone the one that that you that you have now or No, so Antiquorum is a an auction site. Or okay, an auction no, house, not. I guess is it's more appropriate. So this is Antiquorum. I just pulled it up on the screen here. Uh, their next lot is a Geneva auction on May seventh and eighth, and they they actually have really unique pieces that I like a lot. So f for those who follow vintage Rolexes, you may be familiar with the famed Comex Rolex that. Uh, is very hard to come by, very rare. They're estimating between 86000 to 130000 at auction, which I almost guarantee it'll go for above 250000 because it's extremely rare and watches are just hyperly inflated right now, especially ones like this. But they have a ton of uh, unique stuff that they put out there. So, you know, the, the single red Submariner, uh, you know, a, bun a bunch of really cool ones. So I was looking through their website and at the time I had just also been introduced to this brand called uh, Artisans of Geneva, which if you're in Geneva, they would say Artisan de Genève. That's how, that's how they would say it. Hopefully I didn't butcher it. And their whole situation is they're a customizer. So what they do is you send them your own personal watch and they can and will customize it 
and you know work on a design with you. Their claim to fame has been they've partnered with a lot of famous people. So this one in particular, this one was a collaboration with Lance Armstrong, hence all of the yellow. And they worked together to uh, produce this piece. And so they're obviously using that as a marketing tool. But they, they, a lot of their really cool pieces have been Daytonas. But a few years ago, they, they started off doing a lot of Submariners. And they've since done a few paddocks and a few others. But their claim to fame is they skeletonize a lot of Daytonas. And they make them look really cool. So I was on um, I was on this auction. They were doing an auction in August of 2021 uh, in Hong Kong, and I was just looking through the pieces, and I found an Artisans of Geneva Rolex a Submariner that I thought looked great. It was the the name of it, and here's a picture of the one that I wound up getting. This is referred to as a tribute to the reference 5513 Submariner with an Explorer dial. So what that means for those who have no idea of any of that is the Explorer dial is famous for these three numbers versus a regular Submariner just has these hash marks. A, an Explorer dial has the three, the six, and the nine in this font. And a lot of the vintage Rolexes they have a patina where the hash marks get, you know, yellowish. And so they're, they're basically recreating that effect and making it have a vintage feel. But um, this one is essentially a new Rolex that they customized to do that. So it still has the ceramic bezel, still has the, you know, the latest um, stainless steel bracelet that is on the newer uh, Submariners, etc. But it has the uh, the the unique customized dial. In addition to that, they also have a unique signature where they have an exhibition back. Meaning, if I can find one, um, maybe I can just show you on screen. Hang on. So if you can see here, it has a glass case on the back. My camera's having trouble focusing, but you can see, you can see the the inner workings of it essentially. And there's no Rolex out there that has an exhibition back. They always keep it encased with a, a stainless steel backing. So that's kind of their signature. So long story short, I I saw it on there. I signed up for the website, and the the auction was going on at like 3 a.m. local time because it was in Hong Kong. So I woke up, <laughs> I started watching, you know, what he was going to go for. And, and for the record, these customizations, you, you send them the watch and most of them for the Submariners, the actual customization is anywhere from like twenty five dollars to $40,000 just to actually customize it. That's on top of what, whatever you paid for the watch. The Daytonas, that can be anywhere from seventy to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars just to customize it and you know make it look how you want. So it's an expensive watch, and I it, I think at the time they were estimating that it would go anywhere from like fifteen to to thirty thousand dollars U.S. at auction. So I was intrigued by that, and I. I woke up, I was watching the whole auction. They go through every single lot first, and this was like halfway through. So maybe 200 watches I had to wait for to actually get to the one that I was looking for. And they started the bidding and there wasn't a lot of activity. I don't think a lot of people are aware of what it is. And I I wound up bidding on it. I bid, I think I started at like $15,000 and then one other person bid to 18,000 and then uh the next bid up they allowed me to do was i think around 21,000 or so and so that was kind of like my peak i'm like I, I can't go up from here and i wound up winning the bid and i was all excited and then i got the the email that i won what I didn't realize and the rookie mistakes I made with <laughs> bidding at auction is all of these auction 
uh, houses, they make their money on seller fees and buyer fees. So the buyer fee on top of the what they call the hammer price, which is what the price that you know the latest bidder made, is twenty five percent of the oh, the, wow. the, uh, the asking price. So a just for reference, a twenty one thousand dollar price, uh, adding the twenty five percent buyer fee, that's another you know four grand or so. Five. Or no, another it's almost six. Another yeah fifty fifty two fifty. So that was a, a difficult pill to swallow, but I I agreed to it. I committed to it, and I didn't want some <laughs> Chinese official to come after me for for not <laughs> paying what they had asked for. And then on top of that, you have like shipping and insurance that they had to to nick you on. So all in, it was closer to like twenty eight thousand yeah, to get the watch. It was almost that thirty thousand dollar number they were talking about. Exactly. So. Yeah. But I have it. It's on my wrist. <laughs> and uh, I love it. So, you know, it was an emotional buy, clearly. And I could have gotten a regular Submariner for much less. But it's a cool watch. And I'm I'm super happy with it. And I could probably sell it for more than that if I wanted to at some point. I, I don't have any plans to. But it came. I was nervous that I wouldn't get an actual watch or it would be fake or something. It came, I authenticated it with the Artisans de Genève, the, the people over there. So all in all, I wound up with what I wanted, but I, I certainly paid the price. So two questions, uh, and I'll ask them both at the same time. Yeah. They're going to tie into one another. You had mentioned that the name that I'm not even going to try to attempt to do. Can you do it one more time for me? Artisan de Genève. Exactly. You, <laughs> my like redneck voice almost comes out. Exactly. So you had mentioned that there's not a lot of people that are familiar with that shop, right? And you had highlighted that you you yeah. had noticed that, especially during auction, that there might not be as much attention on this watch because it's not as, as um, easily or is not as well known. And kind of building mm -hmm. on that, the second thought is traditionally, if you do anything aftermarket to a watch, it usually hurts the value of it. There's things that you can do to actually help increase it. But, you know, the rule of thumb is 99.99% yeah. of the things that you can do, especially don't put don't put diamonds on a watch, guys. Just don't do that. Anything you do aftermarket really is is only hurting the value of the watch. So are you confident that A, it is still as valuable as you think it is, and B, that there is, I guess, is this name continuing to grow? Is there more of a demand for this kind of specialty? Because it definitely is a specific marketplace. And I, I understand collecting uh, kind of older watches, especially watches that have some patina on them, that have the age, that have the history. You you basically have a brand new watch that has a look of an older watch, which is amazing. So you get the best of both worlds. Exactly. So is there a concern yeah. about it losing value because the things that were done to the watch were done to it? Are you worried about what the buyer pool might look like? I know you obviously don't anticipate selling it, but... Those are those are the, the the questions that pop into my mind. Yeah, so uh, I'll share my screen again. This is the Instagram of the mm -hmm. company. They they have 152,000 followers, which is a decent amount. So they're relatively well known. Their their latest one was this Rust project where they basically recreated a watch like sitting in storage for 100 years. So that's that's kind of cool. This is a Patek they did, which I love. It's really cool. A and others. So ultimately, to answer your question, I my expectation is that my watch is worth nothing. <laughs> and um, I just I just bought a, a hunk of metal for a lot of money that won't wind up appreciating in value. That's that's what I will tell myself. What I think ultimately is that I can sell it for more than I bought it for. There are a few that are on Chrono 24. So let's pull up Chrono 24. That's the most common marketplace for watches that I've found. So if I look up Rolex. So to give an example, this is a, a skeletonized Submariner, which is really cool. Mine's not skeletonized, so it wouldn't be, I wouldn't think it's that value. But they're still being listed for a high price point, like these Daytona is 150 this is a, a John McEnroe. He's a famous left-handed um, tennis player. That is a cool one listed for a hundred. So they're up there, and I think long term 
they're definitely growing. They kind of piggybacked off this trend, especially that was happening in cars. You are, I think, familiar with a singer design the that Porsches. they do exactly yeah. the same thing mm-hmm. with Porsches. Yeah. So if we pull up their Instagram page, this is definitely my favorite car available today <laughs> is the, the singer design Porsche, which ironically, they're also getting into their own watches as well. But what they did and what's unique about them is they did the exact same model where they told people we are not affiliated with Porsche. Porsche, and we have no (laughs) relevancy to them. But what we do is we customize your Porsche to be a really cool, unique, and it feel like new, but it's a classic car. So they basically gut the entire car. They have all of their own parts manufactured, and they recreate what they feel like this car should have been 30 years ago. So these cars... uh, Just to buy one, I think the base package is like $350,000 on top of the actual car itself. And you can't find one on the aftermarket once they've already been created for less than a million dollars. I just saw one uh, go on Bring a Trailer, which is the a car auction site. I think it went for 1.2 million or something like that. So high value and high customization, but you're essentially buying a brand new car that was built for 1980 or 1990. So it's a really interesting proposition, really interesting business. They have a wait list of probably thousands of people that won't be able to get a car for another five, six years. So they are doing this for cars, um, this company, Artisans of Geneva, so that I don't continue to embarrass myself. Uh, They're doing this for watches and they seem to be the leader. So uh, that was a roundabout way of basically telling you that, let's unshare this, that I hope they continue to get more popular. I hope that my watch continues to increase exponentially in value and maybe someday I'll trade it for, for a Patek or something like that, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, you can always just get one of the uh, the swatches, the the Seamaster knockoff. Yeah, <laughs> you mean the the moon swatch? The moon swatch. The moon swatch is what I was getting at. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I still have mixed feelings about that whole thing. <laughs> I know you do. I don't know. I know you do. Well, story <laughs> time. Story time. Part two. I feel like it was a success. Uh, I feel like people probably know more about Rolex than uh, than they did coming into this. So I'll chalk it down as as a W. So make sure to leave your comments below. Uh, we want to know what you guys want to hear us talking about, how we're doing, what you like, what you don't like. Yeah. Pitch us on story time round three. What, what do you guys think we should talk about next? What stories do you want to hear from, from our crazy pasts? <laughs> Tell us in the comments below. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. We'll talk to you soon.